charming rugby players who spend a week with... Is it just me? No, it's not just you. Mark and Paul, a gay couple... And Tony Allman, a civil servant, also retired from Blackpool. I'm sure you remember five in a row, five correct in a row, gets you six with ten seconds to do it in. We begin with Mr Pilkington. Which criminal character from Australia's past was painted by Sidney Nolan and played on the cinema screen by Mick Jagger? Ned Kelly. Yes. What in electronics does the abbreviation LED stand for? Light electronic display. No, Mr Dennis? Light emitting diode. Yes, you're right. <coughs> Mr Doherty, what is the name of the bridge under which ships pass between the Pacific and San Francisco Bay? Golden Gate. Yes. Which daily newspaper in the United States corresponds to the Financial Times here? Wall Street Journal. Right. Some authorities list a father, others list his son, as being the first Danish king of England. Can you name either the father or the son? Can you? Yes, that was the son. Sven Hawkbeard was the father. What is the chapel in Westminster Abbey in which King Charles II, William and Mary and Queen Anne are buried? St George's Chapel. No. Mr Dennis? St Stephen's Chapel. No. Mr Orman? St Edward's Chapel. No. Then I think I'll have to tell you, unless... No. The Chapel of Henry VII is the answer. Whose turn? <coughs> Mr Dennis? <coughs> what kind of a creature is a turnstone? It's a, a bird, a wading bird. It is. The old logo of the Association of British Travel Agents resembled a compass. The current one is a circle divided in half vertically. The right half is half a stylized globe with lines of latitude and longitude. What is on the left side? An aeroplane? No. Might easily have been, but no. Yes, Mr. Pilkington. The sun? No. Then I must tell you the stripes of the Union Jack. Mr. Allman, a battleship launched in 1906 at Portsmouth, made all its predecessors obsolete and the name was used as a generic term for the all big gun battleships. What was its name? Dreadnought. Yes. What was the Christian name of Flaubert's Madame Bovary? Emma. Yes. An amethyst is a purple form of which mineral? Sapphire. No. Mr. Dennis. Corundum. No. Yes, Mr. Pilkington. Carbon. No. Now, Mr. Doherty. Can you think of a mineral? Quartz. Oh, yeah, quartz is right. <laughs> I'm very glad I lingered. And at the end of our opening round, one to Mr. Pilkington, two to Mr. Dennis, two to Mr. Allman, four to Mr. Doherty. Uh, Mr. Pilkington, what is the first line of Keats's Ode to Autumn? Season of Miss and Mellow Fruitfulness. That's right. Very well done. In the magazine Private Eye, continuing about poets, E.J. Thribb, the boy poet, writes, So farewell then, poetic tributes to the recently dead. But who does he quote for personal memories of the deceased or personal opinion? Oh dear. Oh dear. Yes, Mr. Doherty. Is it like Ibid? No. Mr. Dennis. Is it Alf's mum? No. Have a go, Mr. Orman, do you think? Bill's mum. No, you're both round the target, Mr. Dennis, Mr. Orman. Keith's mum is the answer. Of course, Keith's mum. Mr. Doherty, how many tons are there in a megaton? One million? Yes, there are. After what battle was the Emperor Napoleon III taken prisoner by the Prussians? Sedan? Yes. At the end of Mallory's Mort d'Arthur, after the battle, only one knight survives. The king commands him to fling his sword, Excalibur, into the water. Who is he? Now we're going through them all, isn't it? Picking mm -hmm. a good one. Gawain? No, he was a good one, but they're all good ones. Mr. Pilkington. Betty Veer. Betty Veer is right. Well done, sir. All right, don't clap. What do I care? <laughs> I just wondered if you've all gone home, you know. 
Whose turn? Uh, yes, it's Mr. Dennis. What is the name of Matteo Alonso's statue of Jesus that stands on the Uspalata Pass between Chile and Argentina? Christ of the Snows or Andes. I don't think it's called Christ of the Snows, but it's certainly called Christ of the Andes, and you yes. said it very quick after yeah, one okay, after the other. Right. And I can see from your face you have recently been in Chile, sir. <laughs> <laughs> or is it Afghanistan, the no. snow on your boots? Yeah, that's right. See, old Touch of Sherlock Holmes, or even yeah. Mycroft Holmes there. Yeah. Well done, sir. Uh, the Victoria Falls lie between Zambia and which other country? Mozambique. No. Mr. Doherty. Zimbabwe? Yes. Mr. Allman, how many senators does each state send to the United States Senate? Two. Yes. The 12th of May 1999 would have been the 75th birthday of Tony Hancock. Can you tell us the name of the part of London where he shared the house, 23 railway cuttings with Sid James, Bill Carr, Bill Kerr, I should say, and Hattie Jakes, alias Griselda Pugh? East Chief. Where else? What Sheridan Morley called Nicol Kidman fever broke out among his fellow critics after she appeared in David Hare's play The Blue Room, on which earlier play is The Blue Room based? Mr. Dennis? La Ronde. It is quite correct by Arthur Schnitzler. Let's see how the scores have moved. We have three for Mr. Pilkington, four for Mr. Allman, four for Mr. Dennis, and seven for Mr. Doherty. <laughs> Mr. Pilkington, according to the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, the sardine is a small what? Herring. No. Mr. Doherty. Pilchard. Is right. Your turn. There are two types of wrestling competition in the Olympic Games. Freestyle and which other? Greco-Roman? Yes. In the middle of the last century, the poem of which this is a setting brought a Christian name in its French form back to popularity. A century earlier, the Latin form had been popular. What is the Latin form? Come into the garden, Lord, for the black fat with more of that, couldn't you? Uh, so, um, what is the Latin form of the name that was brought back into popularity? Madeline? No, Miss Pilkington. Matilda. Is quite right, Matilda. <laughs> because Matilda and Maud, I'm instructed, are both derived from the old German. We had the song sung by Stuart Burroughs, accompanied by John Constable, and uh, the poem was set by Michael Balfe. It's your turn now, Mr. Dennis. According to tradition, Rhea Sylvia, daughter of the King of Alba Longa, had two famous children. Who were they? Uh, Romulus and Remus. Yes. Which house in Kent belonged to the Sackville West family until they handed it over to the National Trust in 1946? Sissinghurst. No. Uh, no, I mustn't say anything and give the game away. No, you don't know. It's Knoll, K-N-O-L-E. I think they probably handed over, or I think Nigel Nicholson may have handed over Sissinghurst um, to the Trust later. And now, Mr. Orman, British embassies in non-Commonwealth countries fly a modified version of the Union flag. What change is made to it? The Union Jack appears in the Canton only. No, it isn't that. Mr. Pilkington. It has a crown on it isn't that. I must tell you, the royal arms, surrounded by a garland, are in the centre. I'll give you the scores. Four to Mr. Pilkington, four to Mr. Allman, five to Mr. Dennis, nine to Mr. Doherty. <laughs> Mr. Pilkington, what is the title of Robert Graves's book, first published in 1929, which included a description of his experiences in the First World War? Farewell to all that. No. 
Mr. Dennis. Goodbye to all that. Yes, nearly there, Mr. Pilkington. Mr. Dennis had the bullseye. Mr. Doherty, A 1998 film, Good Will Hunting, featured an award called the Fields Medal. For achievement in what branch of learning is the Fields Medal earned? Medicine. No. Mr. Dennis. Mathematics. Is quite right, sir. Your turn. <coughs> in what city are you determined to clap? <laughs> Well done, both Mr. Dennis and the audience there. In what city is the headquarters of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization? Rome. It is. At the Battle of Balaclava, there were two charges by British cavalry, both commemorated by Tennyson. One, of course, was the charge of the Light Brigade. What was the other? The Heavy Brigade. Yes. At the May 1997 British general election, the constituency with the biggest electorate had over 100,000 voters. Where was it? Northern Ireland. No. Mr. Pilkington. The Isle of Wight. Yes, you're right, Mr. Orman. Where exactly in North America is Anticosti Island? Hawaii. No, Mr. Doherty. Is it in Cuba? No. Mr. Dennis. The mouth of the St. Lawrence. Yes, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, but I think you're even more... <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> I think you're, you're more accurate in the province of Quebec. Let me give you the scores now. We have four for Mr. Allman, five for Mr. Pilkington, nine for Mr. Doherty, ten for Mr. Dennis. <laughs> now, at that interesting juncture, we have a listener who steps forward with two questions, hoping to bowl out all our four contestants at two blows. Lawrence Koch from Gouvia, France, asked first, Queen Liliuokalani was the last ruler of her country before it lost its independence in 1893. Which country was it? Hawaii. Yes, you're quite right. Hawaii is the answer. So Mr. Koch secondly asks, in New York City, the name of the borough of Queens derives from Queens County, which was named after which English queen? Have a go. Queen Anne. No, it was Catherine of Braganza, oh. Queen Consort of Charles II. So, Mr. Koch won one, you won one, that means Mr. Koch has won a book token and this round of applause. Mr. Pilkington, in the Medici Gallery of the Louvre, there is a series of 21 paintings depicting the life of Mary de' Medici. From whom did she commission them? Who painted them? Rubens. He did. Fielding began writing his novel Joseph Andrews as a parody, but gradually he dropped the parodic element. What book was he originally parodying? Out of time, Mr. Doherty. Pamela? Yes, by Samuel Richardson. Your turn. What is the difference between a rhombus and a rhomboid? Uh, I'd say a rhombus has equal sides, whereas a rhomboid has parallel sides, um, which are not necessarily equal. Uh, well, uh, uh, you're do doing it with your hands, and you don't need to because you're quite right, unless I get a, a thumbs down from. And he'd be doing it with his hands there, but he's not. He's far too reserved for such an activity. You're quite right. A rhombus has all four sides equal. A rhomboid is a parallelogram with opposite sides equal. The Monopolies and Mergers Commission has been renamed. What is it now known as? By what fizzy new title? time? Have a go. What would you rename the Monopolies and Mergers Commission? Mr. Orman. The Competition Commission. Well done, that's what you would and you were right. <laughs> it's not exactly snappy, is it? But it does come uh. off the tongue a little bit quicker. Mr. Dennis, British forces captured Gibraltar in 1704. What was the treaty by which Spain ceded it nine years later? 
Utrecht. Yes. What was the capital of British India before it was moved to Delhi in 1912? Calcutta. It was. What does a gilt rosette on the medal ribbon of a 1939-45 star tell you about the wearer? He received a wound. No, wasn't that? Or isn't that? Mr. Allman? Is he? It's posthumous. No. Can you think of something, Mr. Doherty, Mr. Pilkington, Mr. Doherty? Uh, took part in D-Day. No, it wasn't that. Mr. Pilkington? He was awarded for the second time. No, it, it means that he took part in the Battle of Britain in 1940. Your turn, Mr. Allman. The article on T.S. Eliot in the Dictionary of National Biography says, unhappiness fostered by the war and by what he once described as a lifelong abulia became the tenor of much of Eliot's verse. A woeful simplification, but there, all we need to know is what is abulia. A-B-O-U-L-I-A. Our time. Mr. Dennis. Uh, chronic indigestion. No. No. <laughs> no, it isn't that. Fancy attributing to a great poet chronic indigestion. <laughs> He'd never actually get round to writing anything, probably, Mr. Pilkington. Depression. No. No. Uh, melancholy. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I think some of you came really rather close melancholy and all like that, but it is specifically a rulia, is loss of willpower or indecisiveness. And that brings us to the end of the round. The scores are now. Five to Mr. Allman, six to Mr. Pilkington, eleven to Mr. Doherty, twelve to Mr. Dennis. <laughs> Mr. Pilkington, why was the comet Temple Tuttle in the news in November 1998, especially on the 17th of that month? It came very close to Jupiter. It may or it may not have done, but that wasn't the reason. Mr. Doherty. Is split in two. I dare say, but that wasn't the reason. <laughs> Mr. Orman. It failed to fulfil a prediction about hitting the Earth. Well, happily, it certainly did. <laughs> if, <laughs> if such a prediction had been made, but that was not the reason. What about Mr. Dennis? Did it crash into Jupiter? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. What it did... It, the debris from this uh, particular comet uh, provided the Leonid meteor shower, which gave a spectacular display on the 17th, all those lights flashing. Now, Mr. Doherty, this music that we now hear was written by Carl Davis for a 1983 film which starred John Hurt. It told a story based on real life, and the film's title was a play on the name of the real-life hero. What was the film called? So can you tell us what the film was called? Our time, Mr. Pilkington? The Naked Civil Servant. No. <laughs> I don't think the Naked Civil Servant was a kind of hero, was he? I don't know. Mr. Dennis. Champions. Is the right answer. <laughs> because the film told the story of the jockey Bob Champion's battle with cancer and um, his winning of the Grand National Royal Philharmonic Orchestra there, conducted by Carl Davis himself, and the pianist was Martin Roscoe. It's your turn, Mr. Dennis. Which Chinese dynasty was founded by Liu Pang, round about 200 BC, and was to reign with one brief interregnum for some 400 years? Tang? No. 
Mr. Doherty. Sung? No, they're all called something like that. Mr. Pilkington. Ming. No. Aren't those vases? <laughs> well, you know what I mean. Mr. Allman. Think of a good uh, <laughs> Chinese word. Mine. No, it's not a bad one, I'm, I'm, although I'm sure you made it up, didn't you? Yeah, yeah of course you did. No, the Han Dynasty. Mr. Allman, on a roulette wheel, the pockets 1 to 36 are coloured alternately red and black. What colour is zero? White. No. Mr. Doherty? Green. It is green. And that's brought us very swiftly again to the end of the round. The scores are 5 to Mr. Allman, 6 to Mr. Pilkington. 12 to Mr. Doherty, 13 to Mr. Dennis. <laughs> what was the name, Mr. Pilkington, of the volcano which destroyed Saint Pierre on Martinique in 1902? No. No? Mr. Doherty? Mount Pelly. Yes, it was. Your turn. After he had lost Rita Hayworth as someone she had been working with in a magic act, Victor Mature said, apparently the way to a girl's heart is to saw her in half. Who had done the sawing in the magic act and made Victor Mature weep because he'd lost Rita Hayworth? I can't see any... Well, yes, I can see someone selling it to Hollywood, but it doesn't sound too likely to me, but there... Any idea, Mr. Doherty? Who might have been doing the soy? It wasn't Winston Churchill or any, anyone like that. Think of someone. I mean... I could come up with a name. Some, Mr. Dennis. Frank Sinatra. No. He was a bit weedy, wasn't he, to do the sawing? Still, he had all sorts of other charms, as I well know. No? Mr. Allman, think of one. Mr. Pilkington, I beg you to. Masculine. No, now he's reasonable because he used to be a magician, but I don't know whether he was alive at that time. Mm -hmm. Masculine and devant, I think. But no. Gary Cooper. Now that's reasonable, but it's wrong. It was Orson Welles. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was entirely too serious to be doing that kind of thing. Mr. Dennis, of what two principal metals is pewter an alloy? Lead and zinc. No. Mr. Doherty. Lead and tin. Is right. Mr. Allman, the luck of Eden Hall was in Eden Hall in Cumbria, but it is now in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. What is it? A bed. No. Let the others have a try. Mr. Doherty. A chair. No. Mr. Pilkington. A cup or drinking vessel. I, I think you must certainly have it, sir. I don't think it was a cup, but it was certainly a drinking vessel. And it might have been a cup, they could have called it that. It was a glass goblet. Yep, you're right. And so, at the end of that round, the scores are... Now, five to Mr. Allman, seven to Mr. Pilkington, thirteen to Mr. Dennis, fourteen to Mr. Doherty. And at that very close point, we embark on our final round. Mr. Pilkington, the man whom Hitler named as his successor as Chancellor, himself committed suicide the day after the Führer. Who was he? Dönitz. No, nope. Mr. Doherty. Joseph Goebbels? Yes, your turn. In 1999, for the very first time, the gold medal of the Royal Institute of British Architects went not to an individual, but to a city. Which city? Time, Mr. Pilkington. Glasgow. No. Pick a city, Mr. Allman, Mr. Dennis. Never know your luck, Mr. Dennis. Bradford. No. Aberdeen. Mr. Allman. Aberdeen. No, it was Barcelona. It is Mr. Dennis's turn. What is the meaning of Dodecanese, the Greek island group? Twelve islands. Yes. According to the book of Genesis, of which kind of wood was Noah? told to make the ark. Gopher. Yes. Why is arterial blood lighter in colour than venous blood? Because there's less oxygen in it. Yes. What does the aromatic herb, Penny Royal, smell of? Any seed? 
No. no. Mr. Allman. Mint. Mint is the right answer. Your turn. Which Prime Minister told a prominent member of his party that a period of silence on your part would be welcome? Attlee. Yes. And he said it to, or he wrote a letter to Harold Lasky uh, to tell him that. The nickel minted between 1913 and 1938 is reckoned by numismatists to be the most beautiful of American coins. It's referred to by the name of the animal depicted on the reverse. Which animal is on the reverse of that nickel? Duck? No. Mr. Doherty? Bear. No. Oh, pick an animal. We're nearly there. Stumps are about to be drawn. Don't miss it. Mr. Dennis? A uh, bison or a buffalo. Is quite right, sir. Well done. <laughs> And that leads us to the end of our round, the end of the competition on this occasion. Here are the final scores. Seven to Mr. Pilkington, seven to Mr. Allman, 15 to Mr. Doherty, 17 to Mr. Dennis. <laughs> so, Mr. Dennis and Mr. Doherty were nip and tuck and arguing the lead all the way through, but it was Mr. Dennis who won, and he goes forward to the semi-finals. Next week, we have four contestants from the north of England. Until then, goodbye. for the news at 11 o'clock. The Ulster Unionist Party has backed its leader, David Trimble, by approving proposals to set up a devolved government for Northern Ireland. The decision means a power-sharing executive, including Sinn Féin, will... Temporary be... poetry in half an hour, as Christopher Cook returns with another series of fine lines. And for the first programme, he travels to Glasgow to meet two of Scotland's most celebrated poets, Liz Lockhead and Robert Crawford. Liz's poems are irreverent, funny and ferocious and give wry glimpses of the sex war and its battleground. Robert, on the other hand, widely acclaimed as one of the finest of the younger generation Scottish poets, has touched on modern masculinity in his work, as well as shedding a brilliant light on deep Scottish themes. Both poets write with an acute sense of place and the past. You can hear them read some of their work and join in the conversation, which, which touches on loss, roots and nationality. That's in fine lines at 11.30. And it's after we've searched for another brain to do battle in our grand final. Brain of Britain, 1999. <laughs> A nationwide general knowledge contest for the title Brain of Britain 1999. The chairman is Robert Robinson. Hello, welcome to the last of our semi-finals in which the runners-up with the highest scores from earlier rounds reappear. They are Martin Yours, a naval officer from Portsmouth, Brian Doherty, a research student from Liverpool, Alan Whitaker, a barman from Senon, Penzance, and Alan Bennett, a chemical consultant from Glasgow. We'll just imagine the rules having been read. We'll start with Mr. Ewers. What does the Japanese national flag look like? The red circle representing the sun on a white background. Yep, well done. There is a famous ruined site at Borobudur in central Java in Indonesia. What are the ruins of? Um, a giant statue of the Buddha. No. Mr. Whitaker. Um, a, a Buddhist stupa. A Buddhist um, temple type thing. You, I knew you were using the technical word and dazzling me with it. I didn't know what the word meant, but yes, a temple. You're absolutely right, Mr. Doherty. Which 19th century novelist was known to his admirers as the Wizard of the North? Thackeray. No, Mr. Bennett. Sir Walter Scott. Yes, Sir Walter Scott. It's now Mr. Whitaker's turn. Which unit provides the pikemen who escort the Lord Mayor of London's coach on show day? The Omen of the Guard? No. Mr. Bennett? The uh, Halberdiers? No. Any idea? No, the others look um, dumbfounded. 
The Honourable Artillery Company is the answer. It's now, Mr. Bennett. What was the native country of Sonia Gandhi, Rajiv Gandhi's widow, who in May 1999 resigned and then resumed the presidency of the Indian Congress Party? Italy. Yes. In 1998, Sir Donald Bradman celebrated his uh, 90th birthday, and it was also the 150th anniversary of the birth of W.G. Grace. Donald Bradman played for two Australian states, New South Wales and South Australia, and Dr. Grace for two counties. Can you name either one of those? Lancashire. No. Mr. Doherty. Middlesex. No. Mr. Whitaker. Gloucestershire. Gloucestershire's quite right. The other, I'm sure you know the answer. No, I don't. Oh, dear. <laughs> London County is the other one, but certainly Gloucestershire, quite right. And at the end of our first round, Mr. Doherty is yet to score. One to Mr. Ewers, two to Mr. Whitaker, two to Mr. Bennett. <laughs> Can you tell us, Mr. Ewers, who was the manager of the England football team which won the 1966 World Cup and who died in April 1999? Alfred Ramsey. Yes. In December 1998, the Inland Revenue opened an exhibition in Somerset House to mark the 200th anniversary of the first introduction of income tax. Dancing in the streets, of course. Which Prime Minister brought it in? Pitt. The Elder. No. Pitt. Mr Bennett? Pitt's the Younger. Yes. <laughs> I'd have given it to you had it not been the semi-final, Mr Ewers. <laughs> Mr Doherty, what in archaeology are grave goods? Items found in a grave, um, in a burial. Uh, well, yeah, jewellery, things like that. No, Mr. Ewers. Uh, they're the items put in the grave to accompany the soul of the dead person into the next world. That's right, personal things. I mean, what you were saying, Mr. Doherty, was near but not quite on the button. Mr. Ewers had it. Mr. Whitaker. If you had to pay tithes to the local church, what proportion of your produce did you have to hand over? A tenth. Yes. What is the variety of lignite which has been worked to make jewellery and which was especially popular in the last century? Jet. It is. To whom or what is Shelley's poem addressed that ends, If winter comes, can spring be far behind? Sir Skylark. No, Mr. Doherty. The West Wind? Yes, the West Wind is right. Well done. <laughs> Mr. Bennett, 1999 is the 40th anniversary of the foundation of Jersey Zoo, and it has been renamed to commemorate its founder, who was whom? Solly Zuckerman? No, Mr. Doherty. Gerald Durrell? He's quite right, sir. Gerald Durrell is the answer. And at the end of the round, the scores are these... Two to Mr. Doherty, three to Mr. Bennett, three to Mr. Ewers, and four to Mr. Whitaker. <laughs> Mr. Ewers, under which king did the Union Jack assume its early first form without the St. Patrick's Cross? William the Third. No. Mr. Bennett. George the Third. No. Mr. Doherty. George the First. No. <laughs> Mr. Whitaker. James the First. Oh, yes, James I and James VI of Scotland. He was both, wasn't he? Well done, well done. <laughs> Mr. Doherty, which planet was known as both Hesperus and Phosphorus to the Greeks? Venus? Yes. Which explorer in 1488 became the first to round the Cape of Good Hope? Vasco da Gama? No. Mr. Whitaker? Bartholomew. Bartholomew Diaz. Yes, you're right. Your turn. Which French wine-growing region produces Sancerre, Muscadet, Puy Fumé and Chinon? Burgundy. No, Mr. Bennett. Loire. The Loire is right. It's your turn. In what year was the Battle of Sheriff Muir fought? 1715. Yes. What is the maximum amount any one person can put into an individual savings account in the first year? Seven thousand pounds. Is right. In which play do the servants Yasha, Dunyasha, and Furs appear? The three sisters. No, Mr. Doherty. Cherry Orchard. Is right. Yes, near miss, Mr. Bennett. Cherry Orchard is right. And at the end of the round, how do the scores stand? 
What we have are these, three to Mr. Ewers, four to Mr. Doherty, six for Mr. Whitaker, six for Mr. Bennett. <laughs> Mr. Ewers, what kind of animals live in a formicary? Ants. They do. Three of the lender or states of Germany are cities. Berlin and Hamburg are two of them. What is the third? Munich. No, Mr. Doherty. Bremen. Bremen is right. Your turn. Who at the age of 72 took over as architect of the Basilica of St. Peter's in Rome after the death of Antonio da San Gallo? M Michelangelo? Yes. These are the closing bars, the ones we now hear, of a 1941 symphonic work which Charles Miller, based on melodies from what was the original composer's biggest stage success from 14 years earlier. Who was that composer? Gershwin? No. Mr. Bennett? Irving Berlin? No. Mr. Ewers? Jerome Kern? Absolutely right, sir. The other one, Jerome Kern. <laughs> Miller based his work, Scenario, on showboat tunes, and it was commissioned by Arthur Rodzinski, played there by the Utah Symphony Orchestra. Mr. Whitaker, which British politician founded the New Party in 1931? Mosley. He did. In the Grand Prix. National Historic Park in Nova Scotia is a statue of the eponymous heroine of a poem by Longfellow based on the deportation of the French settlers from Acadia in 1755. What was her name? Out of time? Mr. Bennett? Pocahontas? No. I see the connection. I see the way your mind was working. Do the others have a clue? No? Shake their heads, Mr. Doherty? No? Then I must tell you, Evangeline is the answer. And a very proper name indeed. Mr. Bennett, what was Dagonet, later Sir Dagonet, at the court of King Arthur? The court jester? That's what he was. Which animal used to be known to zoologists as Salactos maritimus, but he's now called Ursus Maritimus. Polar bear? Yes. When it was under the Habsburg Empire, the city, which is the capital of Slovenia, was called Leibach. What is it called now? Ljubljana. Yes. Who was Sir John Hublon, whose picture is on the 50 pound note? He was an artist. No, Mr. Doherty. Was he, was he the first governor of the Bank of England? Yes, he was. Well done, sir. Now, let's see how the scores have changed. They're now these. Five to Mr. Ewers, seven to Mr. Doherty, seven to Mr. Whitaker, nine to Mr. Bennett. <laughs> and now we have, uh, we're about halfway through our quiz, um, and a listener steps forward to challenge our four contestants with two questions. She is Marion Herod from London, and first she asks you, all four of you, as you consult together, the section of the Parnassus Frieze on the Albert Memorial in Kensington Gardens, which depicts poets and musicians, has a seated figure of Homer at the centre. At his feet, two poets, one English and one continental European, are reclining. Can you say who they are? Those two reclining figures, those two poets. Well, you, you no good shaking your heads at each other. <clears throat> You're going to have to guess if you don't know. You didn't ask the others. Go try for Byron. No. And anyway, that wouldn't be an answer, Mr. Ewers, because I needed two names, didn't I? You're wrong anyway. Chance another. I mean, it won't help you, but it might sound better. Oh, oh. Yeah, why didn't you say that at first, Mr. Whitaker? Dante certainly is one. The other's Shakespeare, what else? 
Yeah. So you got that handsomely wrong, if I may say. <laughs> Not that I wish to rub it in. Good heavens. Now, uh, Marion Herod's second question, which Shakespeare character... I don't know why I'm laughing. I'll tell you afterwards. Which Shakespeare character said, I would as leaf be thrust through a quickset hedge as cry poo to a callow throstle? I'll repeat it if you like. I quite like the sound of it. I would as leaf be thrust through a quickset hedge as cry poo to a callow throstle. Oh, we've got an obvious one, Falstaff. No, no Shakespeare character said it. Uh, it was W.S. Gilbert of Gilbert and Sullivan who said to a friend he found Shakespeare an obscure writer. And when the friend objected, Gilbert quoted this, that, that I've just quoted. The friend explained what Shakespeare meant, but said he couldn't recall where it came from. And Gilbert said, I've just invented it. <laughs> and jolly good Shakespeare it is, he added. So, handsomely, handsomely, Marion Herod has defeated you all. She gets a book token and a round of applause. <laughs> Mr. Ewers, the 1351 Statute of Labourers was passed as one of the consequences of the Black Death. What was its principal objective? Would it be to stop labourers moving around for the highest price and keep them in one place? No. Mr. Whitaker. To keep the wage levels same as before the Black Death as afterwards. Precisely. But I thought Mr. Ewers, I mean, I dare say all that came into it as well, but Mr. Whitaker has it right on the bullseye. Mr. Whitaker, in July 1998. Out of time, Mr. Ewers. Chief Chief Whip. No. Mr. Bennett. Deputy Speaker. No. Mr. Whitaker. Uh, chairman of a party. No. I must tell you, the General Secretary of the Labour Party. That was a near miss, Mr. Whitaker. It's your turn. Someone wrote to the Times newspaper about Mr. Blair's well-publicised secret visits to hospitals and quoted a line of poetry, Do good by stealth and blush to find it fame. Who was the poet? Wordsworth. No. Mr. Bennett. John Donne. No. Mr. Ewers. Keats. No. Now, Mr. Doherty. <coughs> Byron. No, it was Pope, Alexander Pope. Mr. Bennett, the critic Kenneth Tynan once wrote that he could not love anyone who did not wish to see which play? Hamlet. No. Mr. Whitaker. Macbeth. No. Mr. Ewers. Oh, Calcutta. <laughs> oh, Calcutta. No. <laughs> Pick a play, Mr. Doherty. Don't be left out. Midsummer Night's Dream. No. John Osborne's look back in anger is the answer. Let me tell you what the scores are now. Five for Mr. Ewers, seven to Mr. Doherty, eight to Mr. Whitaker, nine to Mr. Bennett. In April 1999, Edinburgh Airport was having to renumber the ends of its runways, Mr. Ewers. What do these numbers indicate? The direction of the runway. I think that's right, the compass bearings, yes, very fundamentally, yes. Which fellow member of the Commonwealth is the closest to Australia? Papua New Guinea. You're right. What in architecture is a jib door? Is this a door that opens... You're doing Divide wonderful, the wonderful miming there. <laughs> Sorry, it's, it's, a, it's a door that, open, that forms two doors by opening at the middle. No, it isn't that. Mr Whitaker. Secret door. I, uh, yes, it's a secret door because it's a flush door and it's papered over and you can't see it, so it must be a secret door. Well done. Mr Doherty, who was Secretary General of the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation during NATO's intervention in Kosovo? Time. Mr. Bennett? Javier Solana. Yes, you're right. Mr. Whitaker? While the nation waited to learn who was to succeed Ted Hughes as poet laureate, the first ever children's laureate, 
children's laureate, I should have emphasised children's laureate, was appointed. Who is it? Though whether the children cried out, give us a laureate, I don't know. Armitage. Things... Armitage. No. Any idea, any of the rest, I wonder. Let me tell you, it was Quentin Blake, the answer. And now it's Mr Bennett. Which American invented vulcanised rubber in the 1840s? Mr. Firestone. No. Mr. Doherty? Mr. Goodyear. Mr. Goodyear did it. You're right. And let me tell you the scores. Ah, uh, they're so close. Strung out down the course. Seven to Mr. Ewers, eight to Mr. Doherty, nine to Mr. Whitaker, ten to Mr. Bennett. <laughs> Mr. Ewers, this being the 350th anniversary of the execution of King Charles, we have a setting of a poem by a 19th century poet about those who followed him in the Civil War. You have to tell us the name of the poet. No. Mr. Whitaker. Sophie? No. Mr. Doherty. Hawkins? No. No, Mr. Bennett. I'll try Wordsworth. No, Browning was the answer. Marching Along is one of his cavalier tunes. It was sung there by the Traverber male voice choir. Mr. Doherty. According to 1066 and all that, the cavaliers were wrong but romantic. The roundheads were right but what? Out of time, Mr. Bennett. Boring. No. Mr. Whitaker. Um, do things the wrong way. No. Mr. Ewers. Dull. No. Uh, it, the answer is that the roundheads were right but repulsive. <laughs> Whose turn is it? Yes, Mr. Whitaker. Which European country became nominally independent in 1939, lost its independence in 1945, and gained it again in 1993? Out of time, Mr. Doherty. Croatia? No. Mr. Bennett? Yugos sorry, Yugoslavia? No. Mr. Ewers? Slovenia? No. Slovakia is the answer. So close. <laughs> and now, Mr. Bennett, which novel has, as one of its two principal villains, the scheming Vicomte de Valmont? Count of Monte Cristo? No. Mr. Whitaker? Back up not down. No. Mr. Ewers? Three Musketeers? No. Then I must tell you, it is Les Liaisons Dangereuses. And at the end of the round, let's see the scores. They are these. Dear me, yes. They're the same. Seven to Mr. Ewers, eight to Mr. Doherty, nine to Mr. Whitaker, and ten to Mr. Bennett. Can you tell us, Mr. Ewers, why were the guinea coins struck between 1787 and 1799 in George III's reign known as spade guineas? Because on one side or the other they had a picture of somebody with an agricultural implement like a spade. <laughs> no, it wasn't that. Mr. Bennett? A reference to um, George III's uh, horticultural interests? Uh, no. Very interesting answers. Have a try, Mr. Doctor. Mr. Whitaker. It's a guess. Um, did it um, change from 30 shillings to worth 30 shillings to 21 shillings? Uh, no, no. Why would that have made them call it a spade, Gilly? You don't know, but you're just chancing it. It's quite something. right, too. Mr. Doherty, have a go. Did it have um, something cut off his floor? Uh, Why would that mean it was a spade? Uh, well, I just thought there might be another meaning 
to the word rather than the... Yeah. The no, all nice tries. Perhaps more interesting than the real answer, which is that the shield on the reverse was shaped like a spade. <laughs> Mr. Doherty, the Rose Bay willow herb has another name which relates to the reason why it used to be common on bomb sites. What is the other name? Time. Mr. Whittaker. Fireweed. Indeed, you're right, fireweed. Mr. Whittaker, of which island are Cape Race and Cape Pine southernmost points? Alderney. No. Mr. Bennett. The South Island of New Zealand. No. Mr. Doherty. Tasmania. No. Mr. Ewers. Long Island. No. Newfoundland is the answer. Now, Mr. Bennett, one match in the 1999 Cricket World Cup was played outside the British Isles. Where? In Holland. Yes, Amsterdam, to be precise. Well done. <laughs> who was the man who ruled Cuba between 1933 and 1944 and from 1952 to 1959 when he was overthrown by Fidel Castro? Batista. Yes. When Walt Disney devised his mouse, his first name was not to have been Mickey. What was he to have been called? Mortimer. Yes. At the end of which narrative poem does Keats write, Porfiro and Madeline are gone. Aye, ages long ago, these lovers fled away into the storm. The Ode to Autumn? No. Are you up on your Keats, lads? Yes, Mr. Doherty. St. Agnes Eve. Yes, the Eve of St. Agnes. Well done. You said it rather despairingly. Well, but... choosing between two, yeah. Uh -huh. And now, tell, let me tell you the scores. They're these. Seven to Mr. Ewers, nine to Mr. Doherty, ten to Mr. Whitaker, thirteen to Mr. Bennett. Our last round begins with Mr. Ewers. What chemical compound, Mr. Ewers, are pearls mainly made of? Calcium carbonate. They are. Because of a fall in the price of a product that Zanzibar has long been dependent on, the island is turning to tourism to diversify its economy. What is the island's primary crop for export? Coconut? No, Mr. Doherty. Copra? No, Mr. Whitaker. Clove. Cloves is right. And since you're always used, uh, urged to use cloves sparingly, it doesn't sound like much of a product to be the main thing, but there it is. Mr. Doherty, from which fruit was marmalade originally made and from which its name is derived? Mm, well, quince? Yes! Yes, well done. Again, you looked a little despairing when he came to you. Uh, Quince's, the Portuguese for Quince, is Marmelo. What was the family name of Kenneth, the ninth century king, under whom the Picts and Scots were first united? Macalpine. Right. What is the official language of Bangladesh? I would have thought Bengali. Yes. In the line of succession to the throne, there are ten people before we get to someone who is not a direct descendant of the queen. Who is that someone? It's not something like the Archbishop of Canterbury or something, is it? <laughs> I, no I don't know. That's rather more than he's been, he'd be looking for. But mind you, he would grace it, wouldn't he, in his way? With that, that, that robe he wears full of hellfire flames. I don't know how he managed it that way. A warning to the curious, perhaps. Mr. Bennett. Prince Michael of Kent? No. Mr. Ewers? Princess Margaret? Yes, sir. Well done. Your turn now, Mr. Whitaker. What is a fan chart? A map of the stars? No, Mr. Bennett. It's a diagram in which the, um, an arc is divided into uh, smaller arcs, smaller um, segments. Oh, yes. What we've got down here, the question is, what is a fan chart? And the answer is a chart resembling a fan. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I mean, that's only the half of it. You know, it's uh, half a pie chart. But what you described was perfectly accurate. Mr. Bennett, what name was given to the Australian continent by the first explorers? Arnhem Land. No, Mr. Doherty. New Holland. New Holland is perfectly correct. Now I will give you at the end of that round, the end of the competition on this occasion, the final scores, and they are nine to Mr. Ewers, 11 to Mr. Whitaker, 
13 to Mr. Doherty, 14 to Mr. Bennett. I think you'll all agree, you'll all agree it was a very close run thing. But Mr. Bennett is our winner. We congratulate him. He... The chairman of Brain of Britain was Robert Robinson. The questions were set by Ian Gillies. The programme was devised by John P. Wynne. And the producer was Richard Edis. If you'd like to be considered as a contestant for Brain of Britain 2000, then please write now requesting an audition to Brain of Britain, BBC Radio 4, London W1A, 1AA. Each morning next week, BBC Radio 4 presents the latest volumes of the evocative auto...